everyone. It's so nice to see everybody. I am so excited. Um, today we will be talking with Jenny from Sex Positive Sex Ed. So as I am waiting for her to join, okay, perfect. She is here. Go live. Okay, we're connecting now. Hello! Oh. Hello! <laughs> and hello! Uh, this is Sophie. I was going to share. I'm home alone with three cats right now. So Aww. they are hams and they love video chats. They love Zoom. So you're, they'll make some of Yay! Clearly make some appearances for us. <laughs> I am so happy. <laughs> I love animals. Oh my gosh, it's cracking me up. Yes. I'm glad we could make this happen. Yes, thank okay. you for being willing to shift around. I certainly appreciate it. No problem. So let me go ahead and just do a little introduction. So this is Jenny. She took over my IG stories this past Tuesday. She um, currently resides at Sex Positive Sex Ed. I checked out your amazing link in bio. You have some incredible blog posts and information there. You're a sex educator and you bring awareness around HIV as well as other STIs and really take a space that I think is filled with a lot of shame and you shed a lot of light on there through education and open communication and conversation. Well, thank you. That was so lovely. I'm blushing. Yes. I'm hot because it's warm in Seattle today, but I'm flush. Yes, <laughs> yes. So now question, um, do you, since this is a happy hour, are you having anything to drink right now? I have some rosé. Nice. I gave up wine for a couple weeks just because yes. I felt like I was so wined out. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I was just like over it. I was like, this was like my, our first response to quarantine. You know, we like yes. stocked up and had our own little happy hours at home, but I was just yes. over it. So this was breaking in my first bottle in a while. So. Yay. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Yes, I am finishing off um, a bottle of red that we um, opened the other night. And um, yeah, I was I was having lots of wine, lots of wine. And then like our stock ran low. And then we recently filled back up. So yep. yes, we have some people on here saying, haha, I feel that. Yep. So yes. So I loved all the information you shared on um, my, on the Instagram takeover. It was so incredibly amazing. And one of the things that I'm really interested in is how did you get into this work? So I know that you shared some of it, but I just love to know kind of how did people find their way um, to what you're doing now? Sure. So my journey has been like, up and down and it's changed with which I also think is just like so normal uh, but what got me really interested and excited about talking about sexuality sexual health anything goes all the way back to when I was a freshman in college mm -hmm. and we had a speech assignment to talk about something that we considered a problem a possible solution and then a speech to just kind of like a call to action right and for whatever reason I, I couldn't even tell you at this point why I had the idea to talk about comprehensive sex ed, but I did. It was the first time <laughs> I didn't really amazing. have sex ed in high right. school, didn't really have probably like a 10 minute conversation with my mom when I was in fifth grade. But mm -hmm. for whatever reason, I think that I got kind of like fired up about the fact that my professor didn't want me to talk about this. She was like, I don't think that, like, I don't think that's a big enough issue. Can you find something more relevant? whatever and that just made me want to talk about it more and I was right. like no I've got someone to like prove wrong let's do it and um contrary to what I heard most people saying about like their speech class in college they were like put that off forever I hate it I just realized I loved it and I just loved the feeling of talking about something that I thought was important and right. hearing feedback from yeah. my peers in class and 
it ended up going like really, really well. And people loved it. And I was like, yes, okay, what can I do with this? Yeah. And so uh, at Penn State, they had a minor in sexuality and gender studies, which is awesome. I'm seeing mm -hmm. that more common now, but this was 10, 11 years ago. Right. Uh, that wasn't even really a thing still in like the late 2000s. Right. But I started, I picked up that minor and then got the opportunity to be a teaching assistant for a few years. Really got into like the traditional role of maybe like being in a classroom, doing demonstrations, education in that way. Mm -hmm. And then when I went to grad school, I studied health and risk communication, which is basically the study of how people get their information about health and mm -hmm. um, from where that comes from or when they get it, from who, how that affects the way that they like live their day-to-day -day life right. and the choices that they make. And so that was just like mind blowing for me. I absolutely loved it. And mm -hmm. that took me uh, to the field of HIV, which is obviously an STI that is so stigmatized right. and so much more about like cultural issues and uh, the way that we talk about HIV right. and the myths and the information we don't have as opposed to just like, telling people to use a condom or these right. individual like protection behaviors. So that is where I found my niche. And I was like, this is awesome. This is what I love. How can I teach other people the things that I learned? Even as someone with a background in sexuality, I had the classes mm -hmm. and then uh, actually being an HIV prevention specialist, I still mm -hmm. learned so much that right. I would have never known. So how could I take that and just spread the word, raise awareness about HIV, STI stigma in general. And so that's where I am now. So a sex educator, but I really, but I really love focusing on community health and bigger things that we can do other than just like I said, telling people to use condoms. Right. Or yeah, just kind of be right. more realistic. What are what is what really is going to make a difference? And to me, that's talking about these things. Right. And I think that's so huge is because so much of this is shrouded in like, you know, people don't talk about it. People don't talk about sex. They don't talk about in with my stuff, pelvic floor. Mm -hmm. And so it's so huge to speak this truth from the mountaintop so people can have a good understanding. Um, I went to a um, private high school. Mm -hmm. And so and like, uh, all of my upbringing was was private and school. And so like health class, sex ed class, I mean, in a Catholic school is like, you know, Shame, shame, yeah. shame, you know, and so it's very fascinating to me. Um, even like, so part of my thing, I made these like cute stickers that have clitorises on them. And many of my friends who have them have kids. And they're like, you know, my kid asked me, what is this on your water bottle? Like, what is this funny thing? I want one. And they were just kind of like, Ooh, hmm, how do I talk about this? organ and what it does and what it and, and they're like it was really kind of like a challenge for me but like also something where we pride ourselves on being a household that says vagina and penis and this and so why is it suddenly that I feel nervous to tell my kid this is a clitoris you know and like this is what it is so I love that so what so what's your like so do you work from home? Do you work from your for yourself? Like with all of this amazing background, what do you what do you do on the daily? Yeah, so that's my goal. That's what I'm working on right now is figuring mm -hmm. out how I can do this from home and for myself. Yeah. Um, my husband and I moved out to Washington last end of last summer. Mm -hmm. And I, I uh, started a role doing similar HIV prevention work. It was not good. Mm -hmm. The place that I found out here. And uh, what actually made me decide that I needed to like maybe take this on for myself and see where right. I can do uh, like as an independent person, uh, I went to a training for that, uh, for that role, which mm -hmm. actually is a really, uh, really exciting opportunity in my, in my eyes. There's a rule or I guess a law, I don't know how you would, policy mm -hmm. in Washington state uh, for folks that work in healthcare of any mm -hmm. kind 
uh, that's, you know, I had folks in this training that were like massage therapists and dentists mm -hmm. and nurses, anything. And as someone with a background in uh, public health and health communication, I was like, wow, that's awesome. That is such mm -hmm. a great opportunity to right. uh, not necessarily like force people to learn about HIV, but right. requirement to at least talk about it. Right. So I was so excited. I was geeking out over that because I'm a public health geek. And <laughs> uh, so I went to this training after having, <laughs> again, this is Sophie. She knows Hi, the whole Sophie. story. <laughs> <laughs> um, I went in really excited and I had been working in HIV for a few years at this point mm -hmm. and uh, it ended up being just like a massive disappointment. It was an MD talking about things that were just so irrelevant to what mm -hmm. like I would educate folks about uh, with mm -hmm. HIV, such as, you know, like prevention methods and uh, what it's really like today with all the advances that we've had and uh, testing. It was really so much, it, it was based in stigma. It really was. Mm -hmm. There was like inaccurate facts and inflating like the number of people that have HIV. And it was really hard to sit through because I felt like, you know, who am I? This is a doctor, a right. white coat. Yeah. How do I, you know, and it was just really, really disappointing to know that this was like a one opportunity because most of the people in that group, they admittedly said, you know, this is one of the first times I've talked about this, or at least since right. high school in the 80s. And uh, it was just really disappointing uh, to consider that like a missed opportunity. And right. that's when I was like, okay, this got me like fired up enough. Again, like going back right. to that freshman year speech experience, yes. something just like clicked. And I was like, I want to change this. So that's what I'm doing now. I'm working, trying to figure out where my role is in not just like, it's awesome that I can talk about it on Instagram with my yeah. friends, but what else can I do? So I'm working on developing some like lesson plans and trainings okay. and things that I can potentially actually pitch to the Department of Health in Washington and say, hey, let's check out like this thing yes. that I put together as opposed to that really crappy one. So yes. that's where I'm at right now. And it's been that's weird with COVID because we're at home anyway. Right. Uh, it definitely changes the work because there's no community outreach. There's no, you know, right. going out and talking with people and going into areas and doing testing. So it's really weird to be mm -hmm. working in this field, but it's awesome that so much has moved uh, just like in the past few years in general to online. And it's right. another opportunity to, to reach people that we couldn't reach going out into the community anyway. So totally pretty cool. That's awesome. So um, you were mentioning um, like a lot of the information that this MD was sharing was antiquated and some of the um, numbers were really inflated. So I'm interested to know, like, what are the proper numbers for um, HIV and give us some of those things? Because I think I know for me, it's like, we covered it a little bit in PT school, mm -hmm. but then it's not been something that I've really delved into personally, but I know it's so hugely important mm -hmm. to talk about. So yeah, what are some of those numbers? Sure. So HIV still is a public health issue in 2020. Uh, it definitely has changed mm -hmm. with the scope of how we talk about it and the treatment that's available. I think people are now starting to hear a lot about U equals U and undetectable, uh, which for anyone that hasn't heard this really exciting news, uh, uh, as of the last few years, actually when I first started working in HIV was when the CDC finally started acknowledging these studies that were done and mm -hmm. giving the okay to like spread the word, let's talk about it. Um, folks that have access to um, HIV treatment, which is, I will preface saying that's the number one issue and that's yes. why we still have the, why we're still- They can't um, get the treatment. Yes. So mm -hmm. it's not something to talk about and say like everybody who has HIV can take medication and then not pass it on to partners um, while that's the science. And that is what mm -hmm. undetectable is when a person is taking their antiretrovirals every day um, with consistent visits to their practitioner, mm -hmm. uh, with access to things like housing and food security. Like there's so much more going into that besides just taking that pill. Uh, but those folks um, are able to achieve undetectable status, which mm -hmm. is where their viral load is so low that uh, while it will show up, show up on an HIV test, 
it is not um, a level that's high enough that they're that they are able to to pass that on to their sexual partners so right. obviously just a really huge like break in the research uh, and yeah. that's that, that's life changing. That's amazing. And uh, so there's also the idea of treatment as prevention, where getting as many folks access to HIV care, and getting them to that undetectable level, which again, is more than just like that medication, it's the support. Mm -hmm. And it's just the overall, uh, like life. Yes, like stressors that we can try and control for uh, using that as a way to prevent passing HIV on to others. We can get as many folks undetectable as possible. We can like slow the spread of HIV. And right. a lot of places are doing an amazing job with that. Um, I know the UK has like amazing numbers, uh, but it's still an issue in um, not even, I, I don't want to say like the typical third world countries, but like still here in the United States right? Uh, with the people that uh, aren't, aren't able to access those things. So we still have about 40 million folks um, living with HIV worldwide. It is not in the billions like that doctor that I loved was right. telling everyone. Right. Um, the issue really lies in making sure that we are um, reaching out to the right populations and reaching out to the people that really need it. Mm -hmm. um, something that was unique when I was when I just started doing HIV testing was my supervisor told me I'm gonna say how he worded it uh, he was talking about the number of positive um, HIV tests that they do mm -hmm. in a year and he said that the goal was to have more positives because that meant that we were getting the right people we our efforts mm. were effective and it interesting was yeah, it was a really weird thing to think about because I was like, right. no, of course not. You know, we don't we want, want the number to go down. But the reality is people are still coming in contact with HIV. People are still being diagnosed with HIV or not even being diagnosed, still living right. with HIV, maybe never even knowing that. And the way that we can work towards preventing transmission and lowering the rates of HIV here in, U in the U.S. or in Michigan where I was, it mm -hmm. is finding the folks that were not diagnosed and finding the folks that need tested and then being a support to those people and educating right. and providing these things that can stop it from being Spreading. passed around their community without them knowing. So that right. was a really weird thing to consider, but yeah. looking at it that way, like it definitely makes sense. And, um, and my, and so um, like I remember when I first heard about HIV was from an ER episode. That's how long ago it was. One of the characters on there got it, I think from like a needle stick or something like that. And so what are the, like, who's commonly at risk and what are the risks of, or what are the obviously sexual intercourse, but are those the most common methods of transmission? Because I think sure. a lot of times I know, like, if I were to talk about HIV with my dad, I think he would say, like, oh, that's gay men or something. Mm -hmm. And I and I know that's not the case. But mm -hmm. I think even when I brought it to some of my followers and things or even some of my friends to say that you're going to be on, they're like, oh, how does that apply to me? And I'm like, oh, it mm -hmm. applies. So, yeah, can you tell me, like, of those numbers, who is affected and at, at risk? Sure. So that idea of like, you know, the gay cancer or gay disease, which is literally how HIV was framed when right. it was first became a thing in the 80s. Um, there is some, I mean, I don't know, some truth to that. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the easiest ways to transmit HIV is from anal sex, mm -hmm. uh, just because, oh my goodness, this girl, <laughs> um, just because, um, the anal cavity doesn't create lubrication um, as mm -hmm. opposed to say like the vagina. And there's, uh, it's just much easier for tearing, even tearing. if that's micro tears that you might yeah. not be aware of. And so that, I mean, there's still some, some truth to that, but also heterosexual couples have anal sex as well. So yeah, let's talk about that. Yes. And then uh, uh, IV drug use. So needle mm -hmm. drug use, is another way to pass HIV uh, just because of the direct blood to blood contact. Hmm. Um, you can get uh, come in contact with HIV through a needle stick, say if you work in the healthcare profession, 
Um, I don't think that is as big as like big of an issue as right. people might think that it is, but it, it definitely it's valid and that right. can happen. And that's actually why we have PEP, post-exposure prophylaxis. Uh, it started as being available to uh, folks that work in a hospital or EMTs mm -hmm. or anyone who could be um, poked with a needle in, in the field, especially back in the 80s and 90s uh, before we had uh, different rules with blood donation and right. transfusion. That's not something folks need to be worried about today because now mm -hmm. there are so many tests like that's uh, that's just not it's really oh, I, can, I don't want to say it's not possible but there are right. there are policies and there are things in place to make sure that that that's safe and you don't have to worry right. about that but that very much did used to be a way before in the uh, before the early 90s that you could come in contact with HIV so uh, a lot of what HIV boils down to and the risk groups are people who are marginalized and groups mm -hmm. that don't have access to um, not just sex education in general, but to healthcare or mm -hmm. folks that are uh, living on the street. Um, what is so frustrating about HIV is that we have the tools to, to treat it and to fight transmission, mm -hmm. but those tools aren't always being put in place where they need to. Mm -hmm. um, black uh, MSM, men who have sex with men, are the mm -hmm. highest risk group for coming in contact with HIV. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of that just has to do with um, the access that these folks have and uh, their ability to talk about sex and their ability yep. to talk about, uh, especially like, like man to man sex. Um, yes. It's something that is so highly stigmatized and uh, especially in men of color. Um, right. Latinx men and um, black men. Um, a lot of people are having anal sex with other men, but they don't consider right. themselves gay, gay. Or they know if they talked about it, like they would just be shunned. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it really boils down to social determinants of health and these mm -hmm. things that are more than just that using condoms or not, or right. using lube or being abstinent. It boils down to the whole, the way that um, folks are raised in the environment that they're in and their mm -hmm. ability to get education, to get health care, mm -hmm. to even just talk about things like HIV. So right. that's what I learned when I was in that role and I was doing um, HIV testing, which is like about a 25 minute uh, situation. It's not just like mm -hmm. poke and go. Uh, we just uh, talked about folks lifestyles and uh, a person first approach to how they were going to uh, have safer sex or mm. uh, be less likely to come in contact with HIV and that's not pushing condoms um, if someone has no interest in it and it's not just telling people okay well don't have so many partners right that's not realistic we really right. have to pay attention to the people that we're working with if we really want to make a difference. What's your lifestyle? What's your readiness for mm -hmm. change or adopting these behaviors? And if you're not excited about condoms, okay, do you use lube? Have you tried an external condom? Right. Do you typically have unprotected sex when you're drinking? Okay, how can we plan um, in advance for how we can make that a safer mm -hmm. experience for you. Or if you're interested in prep, that would be perfect for someone who doesn't want to have to think about like right. having that protection. So really just way different than the way we talk about say gonorrhea or chlamydia. It's right. not just a matter of wear a condom, be right. conscious of your partners and testing, but right. there's so many more like societal level things that go into it. Right. Um, that's why that's why we still struggle with that. So I think the best tool, at least what I can do, I'm not that powerful, but not just educating people in with an HIV testing or in that that counseling space, but to tell all my friends and to tell yes. everybody like I, I am that person. I've been that person for years. I'm I'm the friend that love it. Hosts, yeah, like that's me. I love talking about sex. That's what I can do is even someone who may not ever be in these risk groups or may not ever really have to worry about HIV so they you know so we think we never know um but to at least change these myths that people still mm -hmm. believe and 
talk about the positive things, like how you can live with HIV and live mm -hmm. an absolutely thriving, wonderful life as long as we have access to all these other support things. So that's right. why I'm so excited to talk about HIV and talk about U equals U and PrEP and treatment as prevention, because even if it's not with someone who, someone who may be married in a monogamous relationship for life, mm -hmm. uh, at least they can stop contributing to these like, negative right. scary, like, ideas. Well, and I think like the um, one of the things where um, I've heard some good info about HIV is Jonathan Van Ness from mm -hmm. um, Queer Eye uh, for the Straight Guy. Is it? No, wait. Now what it's called? I don't know what That's the new the, one is called. Right. But <laughs> yeah, like the new the new group. Uh -huh. um, and he was saying that he was without his medicine because he has HIV, but it was to the undetectable level. Yeah. And then with all of his travel, he was out um, without, there were going to be a few days where he was without his medicine. And so he explored being able to get that. And it was mm -hmm. like almost three grand out of pocket. Yep. And he's like, of course, now I'm in a, now because of the mm -hmm. show, I'm in a place that I can afford it. But what normal person could, yep. could afford that? So I think that that is really interesting. And I know like for me as a pelvic floor physical therapist, or even when I was in my role as an athletic trainer, there are opportunities for me to talk about safer sex practices and um, to talk about some of these different, you know, whether it's HIV, for sure, for me, I can talk about um, that locus of change, like you were saying, where are you on that as it pertains to HIV, but I even found myself in that like in college with athletic training learning about you know other STIs that people um have had to deal with and mm -hmm. um you know advocating like I remember there was this one guy on our campus who would have sex with a bunch of ladies and he like had chlamydia and we had to report because he was getting all of these people positive mm -hmm. and they were telling him I slept with you you gave me chlamydia and he wasn't going in and getting treatment. Mm -hmm. And I remember that was like a huge thing on our campus. So it's always been something for me that's kind of um, been fascinating because it's like watching people's discomfort and being able to talk about that and being able to like advocate for themselves and all of that stuff I think is so huge and and um important so besides so obviously i know you're extremely passionate about um hiv do you um find yourself commonly talking to people about other stis and um how they can prevent those or just in general educating people that mm -hmm. stis are still a thing i think that like after this quarantine when people can finally like go out again, I kind of was wondering, are we going to see like a surge in numbers? Because right. people are just going to be like, hell yeah, let's yeah. do this, <laughs> you know? No, very valid. I, yeah, I think about that too. I worry about like a, a spike in pregnancy and there are yeah. so many things that quarantine, like people may not think about, but I obviously do working in like right. a sexual health space. There are so many things that already were issues like birth control yeah. access and uh, paying for HIV meds, which I can vouch for. I actually was an HIV case manager uh, for a little while, and that is real. Like they are, they are. I have receipts that I saved from picking up meds from someone that were mm -hmm. twenty five hundred dollars for one month. But that's why. I mean, we're lucky we have programs like Ryan White funding, and there always is something for folks. Folks who are living with HIV uh, mm -hmm. by getting that like connected to uh, an agency like where I worked or some kind of like social work, there's always something to take care of that. And I think that's right. also really important for people to know, like you, uh, I grew up thinking of like Magic Johnson as like, oh yeah, that's just someone, no, he has yes. HIV, but he's rich. So he'll right. live forever. I have really close friends who absolutely are not rich and live off right. the income that I live off of who are living with HIV. But luckily we have things in place so that we can take care them. of these folks and we have housing assistance and medication assistance, et cetera. Right. But uh, your point about uh, like STIs, 
Mm -hmm. People, I think, in general know that the way to prevent STIs is, uh, you know, getting tested, using barrier methods, limiting a number of partners, whatever folks are taught in sex ed. Um, but because it is something that is like, I'll just use this example. When I learned about STIs and sex ed, it was like the horrifying pictures of like a penis yes. that was going to rot off <laughs> or like yes. these really, really scary yes. pictures and stories. And I think that we have also, we um, relate STIs to certain behaviors or certain people. Mm -hmm. um, so one, we don't know how, we don't realize like how common they are. Like you right. are, if you're having sex with multiple partners, it's very likely that you're going to come in contact with an STI. Uh, and also people grew up with these really scary stories and pictures and they think that that's what an STI looks like when mm -hmm. the number one symptom of an STI is no symptoms at all, especially right. for men. Men, luckily, I won't say, <laughs> someone, someone who's had an STI and has an STI, I can say, right. luckily it doesn't have the, uh, some of the scarier symptoms that women uh, or people with vulvas can have. But when we think of STIs as something really scary and like dramatic like that, we're not catching up on the little things that we're like, ooh, that I think that doesn't feel right or that doesn't right. look good. Or, and like I said, people, a lot of folks don't have symptoms at all. So right. they don't ever think, they think only to get tested as, uh, as a means of like confirming that they've come in contact with something. Mm -hmm. So that is something that that's my approach to talking about STIs mm -hmm. is people know it's, it's great to use a condom, internal, external, dental dams. Um, people are aware of these things and I'm not going to stop talking about them. Like it's still right. very valid. We still need to make sure. Cause, cause not, I say, I say that and that I should back up. Not everybody does know that. Right. In general, it's not secret information. Right. But what's secret information is just how common they are mm -hmm. and uh, people not understanding that maybe the, the protocols for getting tested every six months to a That's year. That's what I was going to, that was one of my questions. How frequently should you get tested if you are having sex with people, multiple people, even a single, like, even if you think that you're, you're just having sex with one person, I've talked mm -hmm. to several of my friends where you know, they're like dating, they think they're mm -hmm. maybe dating someone. And it's like, I mean, we're sleeping together, we spend a lot of time together. And then they go to have like the talk with the guy. Yeah. And he was like, um, like, I didn't know we I, I just thought we were like hanging out like I've been seeing yeah. other people and like, they're mm -hmm. like, wait a second. So I was gonna ask how um, frequently do you have to get tested? And, and if you had any tips for bringing that information to light? In a sure. conversation? Yeah, and I totally agree with that. Uh, I just, I was working on a, a piece today about even when folks lose their virginity, they think, uh, you know, like this is the first time I've had sex. I assume the same about the person or I'm only 16, 17 years old. And people think that's not something they have to worry about. So there's not conversation about condom use or um, whatever relevant barrier method to use. Um, and that's just like, so not the case, but we have right. an idea that's just, even if that's not a super, super negative stigma, that's still this, this idea that we have that only people who have all these partners or have yes. been, you know, in the game for years and years, like right. players and we like, cheaters and right. just, like these things that no, like really any person can come in contact with an STI. Yes. It's just, it's just real life. Uh, so in terms of testing, um, it, it varies obviously by person and the type of sex that they're, ha that they're having and individual risk. But um, on average, the recommendation is about every six months to a year, depending on how many partners that you're having. Uh, the clients that I had coming in to get HIV testing, we had a ton of regulars, folks that were awesome, which was great, mm -hmm. like came in um, as frequently um, as we suggested, which was every three to six months. Nice. Uh, because the kicker here is getting, uh, I think, uh, a lot of times there's a lot of confusion with SDI testing, which I absolutely can relate to myself. That is how I thought that I was like completely covered with having all of, you know, every STI screening, uh, 
one, the reality is that when folks go into a provider or something common, like I would go to Planned Parenthood or the mm -hmm. family planning clinic that I was an intern with in college, uh, and assume that when you go in and ask, can I have an, an STI test? And maybe this, this has changed, but it was like, sure, let's go. And it was pee in a cup and you got tested for like chlamydia and gonorrhea. And like, that was right. it. Um, STIs like herpes and HIV, those cannot be diagnosed without a blood test. And I was like, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. I've never had a blood test looking back right. now. Like, that never happened all the times. Like I felt like I was getting tested so much and I honestly probably was getting over tested because uh, the other thing I was going to get to is people think that they're doing the responsible thing uh, when they have like a new partner and then getting tested right after. Yes. Um, it takes time for um, STI antibodies uh, to develop in the body Mm -hmm. uh, particularly um, HIV I'll use because that's the one thing I have example of actually like doing with folks. Uh, there are different types of tests. Uh, there is um, there are blood tests. There's like a cheek swab. Uh, the cheek swab has the biggest window period, which is mm -hmm. the time between when you come in contact with the, with HIV and the time for um, HIV antibodies to mm -hmm. show up in your blood enough to test positive for an HIV test. Uh, the the best tests on the market or the things that we at least um, preferred to use were ones that had that a smaller window period, one that was maybe two months. And that was uh, the test that we did most often. Mm -hmm. But the problem with that not being a general understanding, and I know that's not just for HIV. I don't know as much actual tangible information about other mm -hmm. specific STIs, but I know it's a lot, it's similar timeline. Uh, right. Folks think that having a new partner and then going the next day and getting tested, they're, they're good, they've cleared everything. It takes a while for these things to show up in our body. And antibodies, for anyone, I say that, like I, I need to be aware of the audience, that those are um, the things in our bodies that respond to, a, a, say, a virus like HIV and the things that are fighting HIV in our blood. Uh, so for those to show up, that's how we do the HIV test. antibody test. Uh, so it should be done, uh, I would say, not uh, more frequently than every three months. Because in those cases, you're going to miss something. You mm -hmm. might have a new partner, go to get tested even the next week, uh, test negative for whatever they test you for. And then that's something that you still absolutely could have contracted, but it's going to take a little bit longer okay. for that to show up in your system and show up on a test. So it's a weird thing that we have to to navigate and how to talk about that with people. Like, yeah, that's a really great question uh, because we want to encourage folks to, you know, be proactive in their sex life right. and, with getting STI tests and whatnot. But uh, to, to talk about it in a realistic way and one that's based on the actual evidence and information about STIs right. and how they do show up in the body. Uh, but I would say uh, three to six months for someone who is regularly having new partners uh, and then uh, six months to a year otherwise. Um, and then the the overall, like the guidelines for HIV testing is um, the CDC wants every person in their lifetime to be tested at least once. Mm. Uh, and that I, I actually in my That's interesting. Position, every person at least once. So I personally, I, whenever I go to the doctor, uh, because I watched a Oprah episode again when I was little, and I remember these women um, ended up getting HIV from their spouse, and the mm -hmm. spouse had been out cheating. And so mm -hmm. here are these women that didn't even know, and it came mm -hmm. on. Granted, I'm like this little child watching Oprah. And so honestly, ever since I have been sexually active, I go in and I say, I want the entire mm -hmm. panel. I want to be tested for every mm -hmm. single STI. And I have had so many doctors be like, Laura, you've been with the same mm -hmm. partner for multiple mm -hmm. years. Laura, you like, you know, you had a clean bill before you haven't had a new sexual partner. And I because of this one dang so over scared. episode, I know I'm like every time I go in and they're like, I mean, I even had one doctor that was like, you know, the chance of you getting syphilis in southeastern Minnesota is and I'm like, I don't care. Like, yeah. I'm the one paying for my medical bill. And I want all of the gosh darn 
test. So it's just interesting to me to say like one time in your life, because I, I, I already have been tested one time. So then mm -hmm. what am I just supposed to be like? <laughs> yeah, so. that's a weird thing. And I asked, because uh, we were working with uh, our medical director, like, what, it, why cause this, like, again, this was after I worked in HIV for a little bit. Uh, and I was like, why is that a thing? How does that make any sense? And it's really more um, just like a public health screening. Right. Because um, one point that I'd like to bring up, um, and it goes back to my experience in getting tested. Uh, I worked, I started working in HIV when I was 25. So like years after I was in college and when I would go in college, I never once had a, had an HIV test. And the, the questions that they would ask, like, I think the only question that was involved in our STI screening was, uh, do you sleep with bisexual partners? And because I was or gay or bisexual partners. And I was like, I don't, I don't think so. No. And so right. they're like, okay, then you're not at risk. Well, something about that. And I kind of like, led into this earlier uh a lot of people have sex with like same sex partners but they're not considering themselves yeah. to be gay like yeah. a huge thing in like african-american community and in latino community um people will have partners of the same sex but they're like i'm not gay that's not that's not me and that's right. that's also that's okay like your sexual orientation doesn't necessarily like predict or define the type of sex you're going to have. Right. But when we ask people questions like that, especially like a medical provider asking me in an STI screening or asking someone who is having sex with men and women, um, if you ask the question of your sexual orientation, they're just gonna say, you know, nope, check, they don't yep. need the HIV test. So we made sure to ask questions, you know, do you sleep with men, women, both? Mm -hmm. And it really tried to make it as like casual and non judgmental as possible. Um, so that people are honest and mm -hmm. it's not necessarily even that those folks are like, I mean, they might be like ashamed or not wanting to give those answers, but they might not like understand. Even identify. Why, yeah. Yeah. Why you're asking that. So when I started learning about HIV, I was like, oh my goodness, I had a lot of like unprotected, unprotected sex and partners. Yeah. And that's not, like, why, like maybe that is something we should have talked about, but realistically, I don't know. I mean, every there are people that I had sex with that were not my long-term like right. partner. And I have no idea if that person, who, right. what they do, you know, like there's, Oh, I can tell you 150%, like who knows what my partner, my other partners were doing. And even like I said, talking um, among many of my friends and patients and all of that, it's like so challenging to be like, Hey, like, just so you know, like, I need to know, like, mm -hmm. are you bisexual? I mean, that's a huge yeah, thing. Are totally. you like, and even if you don't identify as that, are you sleeping? I mean, that's a huge vulnerable totally. conversation. And it's not to say that we shouldn't be having these combos, but it's also to acknowledge it's really hard. And you have to trust that whomever, if you're not the person that's going and sleeping, um, with in a same sex thing or whatever, like mm -hmm. you don't necessarily know what that other person could or couldn't have done or whatever. So it's so, cha it's so challenging. So I think that's, but it's, it's good to kind of have that idea of a window. And I do encourage people, uh, to continue to get tested mm -hmm. because I just have seen personally many patients who, um, their partner was sleeping with someone else. And I mean, it's been people who have been married for 50 years. Mm -hmm. And so they were like, what's this thing on my vulva? Mm -hmm. And they go in and they think they're having something else. And it turns out to be, you know, an STI. And mm -hmm. they're like, how is this possible? So I think that that's, um, yeah, it's really kind of huge to note. Um, so on a funner topic, do you get a chance to teach people and educate people about, because I know you have that sex educator background. So mm -hmm. where did you get that? Because I've looked into doing the sex education and sex um, therapist. So mm -hmm. just as a little background for people listening, or if you're listening later, to call yourself a sex educator or to call yourself um, a sex therapist or even what's the other one? Cause are you through, did you get Counselor. yours all through ASEC? Um, I'm not certified by ASEC yet, 
but mm -hmm. I am in that process that that's the program that I'm, I'm going yeah. to be certified right now. Yeah. So it's like, so again, for people who are listening, it's um, like a very rigorous program to go through that has training just like many times the one that I'm looking at is held through a university mm -hmm. um, and you have studying and tests and exams and it's just as if you were going to get um, any degree. Mm -hmm. um, it's not something that you get in the week in over a weekend. It's like a very legitimate, um, super amazing thing. So I like am interested to hear. So you said you're currently going through the credentialing process and all that. Yeah, I'm so glad you asked because that's a thing that I'm starting to see all the time with folks saying that they're certified sex therapist or educator. Mm -hmm. um, and going through that myself, understanding what that really means and what you have to do to be able to ethically say that to folks and to yes. operate in that role. Uh, so I specifically started working towards ASEC certification a little bit over a year ago. So like I said, I studied sexuality in my undergrad program. That was my focus when I went to grad school. Um, but to be able to be a certified um, sex educator, I went to the program at University of Michigan, uh, and that was a year-long program. Yes. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. It's actually the first time that I ever heard about um, pelvic floor therapy, and Yay. it's actually what led me to go to a PT and, like, deal with Yay. my own issues that I was having. So um, that was really cool. I would say number one uh, coolest part was that, meeting so many other people. We had a 75-person cohort. Um, of folks that were doing all different things. Like um, for, um, for ASEC, uh, that is the American Association of Sexuality, Sexuality Educators, Counselors, and Therapists. So we had folks pursuing all three. Uh, it was, I would say, probably more therapy focused and more folks that were uh, working in a counseling or F counseling FMT role, therapy role. Um, but that was a year long process. It's an amazing program because it is um, uh, ASECT affiliated and credentialed, and that provided uh, the education component um, for ASECT certification. So I finished that in February, uh, officially um, received my certificate and everything last month. Uh, so that uh, accomplished the education component that has to be specifically about these thir these certain things, like regardless of the fact that like I've been doing this or learned about it right. in undergrad, there are some there are specific requirements. So um, it was awesome for that. Uh, my program was mostly distance learning based, which was great because I started out when I lived in Michigan and then I moved. Mm. And so a lot of people in the program were from all over. We had folks from like all over the world, which is so cool because it was a really awesome opportunity to learn what other people were doing in the field right. of sexuality. Like it was just, right. that was very cool for that option. So then I finished that education component and then uh, you uh, folks have to have ASEC supervision uh, by someone who is a certified educator, counselor, therapist, mm -hmm. and certified as a supervisor, basically a mentorship program. Right. So that's what I'm working through right now. I finished the you know, the education requirements, the things on paper. And now I'm just working through, um, I have an amazing mentor. Uh, and then eventually I can take these hours, uh, put everything together and then submit that to ASECT, which I wish I had known prior to starting what a process that it is. It's not, like you said, it's not just like take a right. weekend course or, you know, go to a little retreat. Um, it's definitely a big commitment. Uh, in the program that I did at Michigan, you can complete that program and not choose to go on to be certified, which is totally right. fine. And it was great for the experience, but that's my goal. So that's right. what I'm working to right now. Um, but it, it's a lot. I tell people right. that all the time. I get questions and I'm so excited to talk about it. But I also am like really honest. I'm like, when I first started, like when I was already in that first weekend and they talked about uh, what, what was all involved, I was like, my goodness like I know what did I sign up for I know I <laughs> yeah. I I totally hear you I think um I know like uh definitely for pelvic floor related stuff it's sort of anytime you can talk about sex it's sort of like a party trick I feel like people are like 
you know, I'll be like, oh yeah, I was describing to someone how to use anal beads the other day. And they're like, what? You do what for your job? And, um, and it's, but I think that sex education piece and all that you're doing is so huge because, um, I just think a lot of people haven't been exposed to it. I know I haven't. And, um, it is, okay. you know, really fascinating and interesting. So do you get a chance to kind of flex those muscles um, as like a sex educator and what's maybe your favorite topic or maybe your favorite party trick to like pull out? Oh, hello, Kitty. <laughs> <laughs> That's lovely. I knew someone else was going to show up. Uh -huh. um, yeah, no, exactly. I, I love being that person. Yes. Uh, I'm lucky in that I found like my excitement for sex education uh, pretty early in terms of going to like making sure I was going down the right path through education and whatnot for it. Mm -hmm. And so it's something that I've been doing for years now. And uh, I think because of that, it's been a while. Like it's not, it's not weird anymore. Oh, like, yeah, no, I am that totally girl, like not. everyone's like, oh yeah, that's just Jenny on the timeline talking about whatever yeah. like uh and I love that because I also really truly I get a lot of satisfaction from people sharing things with me or asking me questions or talking about their experience having an STI or an abortion or any of these things that we tell people not to talk about mm -hmm. that was my favorite part in doing HIV testing and counseling getting we did feedback we did little forms like you know if you're interested like let us know how it went. And I would like cry sometimes because I was just so happy to see it wasn't necessarily the like information I gave or like I taught them something new, but the fact that someone who came in for a stressful, you know, situation left feeling like that person made me not feel weird about it or like right. I felt accepted. I felt not slutty and dirty yes. and all these things that we associate so I get a I get a ton of just like internal gratification from that I'm really happy that um whatever I'm doing gives off the vibe that like we can talk about whatever and I'm right. gonna I'm not gonna judge you I'm here to help you and make you feel normal and make you feel mm -hmm. like this is Heard just something else to, yeah mm -hmm. I love that and that is a really fun part about this job. And right. it, like, uh, it's it's fun because, yeah, I do get to talk about masturbating and orgasms and like yes. all the really cool, fun parts of sex. But the things that people don't want to talk about or are more shameful or, mm -hmm. you know, they haven't had the opportunity to share with someone else. Mm -hmm. I just like, I love that I can be that person for folks. Yes. So. I hope it, I hope I keep up with that. Like, that's one thing that just means a lot to me. Like, I'm not, I, I'm not in this role for myself. I get, I enjoy right. it. It's fun. Yes. It's the best job in the world, but it's so much about like feeling like I was able to make someone else feel okay or feel oh, yeah. normal. I love that. Yeah, totally. It's always so interesting. Like if we go to parties or something like that, um, my partner, he'll be like, I'll be in deep conversation with someone and people will be like, Oh, what are they, what are they talking about? And he's like, just, just leave them be like, just let them do their thing, you know, or I'll be talking with someone. And after a few moments, they're like hugging me or crying. Mm -hmm. And he's like, he just knows like you just don't ask anymore because it's just like they, you know, probably shared, like you said, something really powerful mm -hmm. or shameful or maybe I gave them education or permission or whatever. And it is such a fun, like, like you said, it's, it's like, well, it just, I don't know, it makes me feel like a superhero or something like that because yeah. it's like, oh, you got a chance to share something with someone mm -hmm. and let them be themselves or vulnerable and I think that having people like you out here who does that work it's so good to know like it's I'm in Minnesota you're all the way in Washington state and like look at all of these people that can be positively affected by that so I know you're on Instagram where is that your primary platform that people can come find you yes mm -hmm. at sex positive sex ed that is my baby Perfect. 
That was my project when I was like, what can I do out here? I just, I, I, I started it right after that stupid training and was like, <laughs> what can I do yes. besides this to just like be a place to talk about what I care about, but hopefully also in that make a difference in other people's perceptions or ideas about these things. So I'm never going to be the type of person or you're never going to find on my page just talking about, you know, this is good, this or bad, this is bad, this is what you should do in a sexual mm -hmm. relationship, this is unsafe or unhealthy behavior. Mm -hmm. Like, I am so much just about raising awareness and being realistic with mm -hmm. folks because that's what I realized when I started doing this work like full time that that's what makes the most difference is right. letting people know what we our whole idea about most things sex related has been like super hyped up in a way yeah. that is just like inaccurate or based in that stigma and it's fear based I, I totally had that myself. Like I definitely, mm -hmm. I did not grow up in a house where we were like constantly having cool conversations about sex no. and relationships. I did not have a good sex that experience, but like. I know, I love that you life. shared on your page. So if people didn't check this out or if you're watching this later, you shared a little question box of what was your first sexual experience like? Mm -hmm. And I had said that mine, I was, I'm, I'm almost 100% certain we used two condoms and like, I don't even know if I got fully undressed. Like I, like it was so awkward mm -hmm. and I think the lights were like fully on like fluorescence overhead freaking lighting, oh, you know? No. I don't want that now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so it's like, I just loved it. And I loved when you were sharing the answers for everything because I'm like, you know, I'm like, oh man, a lot of the sexual experiences were similar to mine and how, and it was interesting to see how people describe them. So I'm like, there's overhead lighting and I'm pretty sure there was two condoms. And like, I remember this and like other people were like painful, awkward, you know, like all the different ways, like some people kind of maybe had more of a picture like I did where some people had a feeling and I thought that was so cool to like see and like also that you got that awesome engagement from your audience. So I definitely I think it. there's something to be said that clearly the content you're sharing is something people find value in. Cause sometimes when I post stickers, I'm like, hello people, I can see you're watching my <laughs> stories. You're not participating. Yeah. And so I loved that so many people participated in that. And I think that's a, testament to what you're sharing and offering thank you that is truly like i mean it that's the most rewarding thing for me in doing any of this like i just want to create some kind of community for mm -hmm. other people to see exactly i i love even that feedback right now i love that mm -hmm. because how many other people can sit and see someone else say like something oh I thought that's what I was that's totally right what I was thinking that is exactly what that was like for me just all, that element of just understanding that this stuff is normal like right it, it pretty much ends there like right the it's good normal and the bad. period <laughs> yes and I also I used to not use that word because there's mm -hmm. I mean what there's no normal like yeah what is normal yeah normal in terms of there is no like perfect way to do th like this or that like everyone has these unique experiences and when you talk about it and when people are able to voice those things you realize wow like I'm not the only one who feels that way or went through right. this experience or it's just really it, the the whole community aspect of it is like so many people out there like we get the same sexual scripts and the same yes. sex education and yes. think that something's wrong with us though. Like think that something is wrong with what we're doing or the sex right. we're having or our vulvas or our penises. Like really, I'm sure how many other people right. have those same have thing same up. Thing. Totally. Well, it was so amazing to have you on my little happy hour live. Um, I would love if you would be open to it, maybe doing a blog or something yeah. that we can share with my community For so we sure. can continue to know about what you do, but also like you said, to spread this information mm -hmm. so that, you know, people can really become educated 
um, because I think everyone, no matter what profession you're in, you really do touch some of these at-risk communities. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, I just want to know, thank you from the bottom of my heart. And we'll talk offline about maybe connecting more. Yes, so fun. Thank you so much. Thank you.